today we're going to touch upon the topic gen ai demystified so uh, in my mind these are some of the challenges which i feel developers usually faces you know there is a software bug you know they tried all the way that they could to do the uh, you know do a module development or a sub module development committed it right but the moment it was tested there was a bug there was a broken code there was a collaborative communication uh, that was expected and the person to whom they needed to reach out was not available the bo has not provided right set of information the time estimation was highly highly less than the realistic timeline and therefore they need to really break their head in terms of making sure that how do they deliver something on time security VAPT was not done because it was not being told, but later onwards when it was told, they already has an answer. Premature optimization without even thinking of, you know, whether this is a repetitive task or not, started thinking about an op automation opportunity. And the, the father of all the problem, ever changing software requirement. We say that we are in agile, but then there are requirements which keep on changing. And, and here is, I think, a couple of things which I want to summarize today. Uh, that there are challenges, you know, the task is pretty repetitive. Uh, the, the context switching is, is pretty evident and pretty vital, right? You're working on one module and then, you know, probably there is a different change that is happening. There is a new uh, request that you get in and then you switch there. There are at times no opportunities or no option no matter the best level of framework that you use, that there are almost manual testing available and who like to do testing? It's the same repetitive work, you know, and you know that at 70% time you will fail, you know, succeed and maybe 30% you would not. And then there is so much of information that you see, you know, you're from BA, you hear from, you know, maybe Scrum Master and so many people, right? And there's so much of information. I think we are in the right set of mind. These are the kind of challenges that, I agree most of us are living with and these have now started becoming a daily struggle for us. So friends, before I start deep diving onto the on what I have in store for you, I just wanted to set up this context that we understand the challenges and this is something not new. As an industry, I think people at certain level and all the levels have tried to address it. At some point of time it is addressed and some point in time it is not addressed, right? Before deep diving ahead, I just wanted to set up what you can expect in this session. People who do not know anything about Gen AI, they can at least get introduced to the concept. People who are really coders and maybe prompt engineers and all of that will see this as a revision. People who are project managers, right, and wanted to take this as an opportunity to get themselves introduced on, will really see this as an opportunity to see how and where can they implement. So the practical application of Gen AI, and that's what our, we wanted to focus on today. And now coming back to, you know, how we talked about the challenges that our developer community usually faces on a daily struggle. Friends, don't worry, you know, there is a solution. And here is a good news. So look, a lot of times, you know, you would have seen that if there would have been a magic where a code completion exercise would have almost become like an automated machine. And here is what you can do that, the opportunities in Gen AI give a strong recommendation that a single text or a single word can help you to express what could be a next level of line code that you would need to write down, something that you would always do in Google, right? You're kind of trying to write down what you're looking and searching for, and you will get plenty of options there. That is one thing which is marvelous, and it is like an online and a virtual assistant sitting with you and helping you identify what is the next level of code and also helps you to get rid of any typos that you make. That's one. Second, automated testing we have heard, right? We have seen that if the test, is, test cases and all of them are being identified, then you can obviously run at least 60 to 70% of them and can see the result. But what we have seen Gen AI getting into the new space is, it also writes the test, test cases. It also runs it catches bug before they reach users. So that means it's a kind of entire new paradigm of testing that you can think of, which is what I think is making the things more different, right? And what Gen AI can really do is to look out for almost all the testing scenarios and then look out for potential issues in your code before even QA identifies it, right? So I think that's basically is a kind of 
opportunity that we see in Gen AI. Third one is, we all know, right, that, you know, right from, from the time when we kind of do some testing and, you know, then start developing it into a QA or maybe, you know, the, the further upper environment, we tend to see the errors and then probably, you know, try to debug it at that time. What we kind of see is Gen AI is also an opportunity where it analyzes the errors, it fixes the errors, and you can consider it to be an opportunity to do an intelligent debugging, which you know, which you know, and kind of try to trace the issues and then try to fix it as well. So that's basically is an opportunity that is being driven by Gen AI. The, th the other one is typically around the context aware help, right? Who can really help you to analyze your code I and understand the code, understand and suggest certain relevant resources almost real time so that your ability to do the things much more faster and much more uh, confidently and much more informed is, is, is really, really high. The last is any kind of best practices that you need, right? Sometimes, you know, you are in the verge of, you know, doing some new coding and then probably you might want it to look out for hey can you tell me what could be the best way to write this code right maybe are there any best practices where i have to put multiple loops but if there is a simple syntax and a simple command which can make it happen so that's called as personalized insights so the good news is a lot of the heavy lifting right that you used to do earlier and there was obviously no other choices but to you know really do that manually a lot of these have been explored and some of these have been are being experimented. Some of these have been implemented and there are potential opportunities to adopt while we look forward for Gen AI implementation. So that's the word of Gen AI, which is what you know I would suggest is, is a good area for all of us to explore and see how it can really start helping us. Moving on, the bigger question is how can you achieve it, right? Because of course, everything is looks all great you know icing on the cake and and so on and so forth but the important point here is that it needs a typical approach so that gen ai does not become a project which has been implemented and then dies own natural death because gen ai has a, such a strong potential market marketers are kind of predicting it to be a billion dollar opportunity so therefore there is a lot of research that is being done that is absolutely going to transform the world and therefore, what, what I feel like that there are almost five to six, in fact, more than 10 areas, which, you know, probably had need to kind of focus at the same time so that Gen AI implementation is more robust, scalable, and it can be adopted across the organization. But few of them, which are typically more nuanced and more impactful are the following. The first is a strategy and the culture. I think ultimately, the reliance of everything you know a developer can do by themselves and not you know aiming towards doing a shift left is a cultural change that we need to aim for so that you know people start leveraging that as an opportunity and start using it <clears throat> the second is the skill and talent you know now of course the the overall full stack developers you know people who have got a strong engineering background and all of that are really needed but on top of it what is also needed is the skilled resources who are actually like data engineering, you know, data science guys who are required to do a lot of AI ML related work, but there is an opportunity for them to start also diving in this field and help implement the use cases, which are typically the ones which are relevant for the users. The third one is a target architecture, and you would be surprised to see how the target architecture has changed. And some of you have worked on the data science field would kind of understand that a lot of this has been kind of taken up from the data science world where we used to do AI ML algorithm a lot, but it is a combination of both data science and data engineering. And that's where I think this field is, is actually an intersection of the development work and a lot of work that we do across data platform. <clears throat> the fourth thing is that beside everything that you wanted to do at a sustainable and a long term level, it is very important that you think about what are the typical use case backlog that you wanted to create and what are the typical milestone that you wanted to really, you know, measure yourself on so that you are able to develop, let's say, some of those use cases, see some early signs of success and move to the next level. Now, since this is a new field and therefore an opportunity for everyone to do some experiment, right? Can, can I think of, you know, maybe two things? For example, I wanted to build up a code which can really debug it at the time when I'm doing it. I know there are a lot of 
you know ids which are kind of offering it right now but looking at your perspective your environment and then doing it online for you is a art and a science that is needed and therefore the need for also an experimentation culture experimentation environment is mandatorily because that's where the scalability is very high so these are i think five different areas which are important as you think about a scaling jenny i i will typically focus more on the target architecture because i believe that the most of the people that we have today are the ones you know who are developers so here is a very you know refined and easy version of how an architecture should look like you know as any other application you can really understand that the front end or the application layer is the one where the user interaction happens or maybe interconnectivity to another application happens that's the 0.05 and then the api is right which will interconnect you from the the front end to the to the engine where the most of the genii algorithms usually run is the llms right which is your large language models and we'll speak about it in a minute and then the underlying infrastructure right now here you are not talking about the cpus you're actually talking about gpus because the uh, the llm models are really compute and the resource intensive right and therefore that's the that's the you know the second last layer and the first layer is the data right where you need the underlying data and and you know that's what actually grows up the ladder and then possibly use for training the llm models and moves further so that's a you know a little bit high level of architecture uh, and then what you would also need to know and and we'll cover a lot of this in a minute that there is an ability for you to make sure that everything that you are setting up in LLM is also being uh, you know, added by an ops layer. And what it essentially means, the entire paradigm of uh, you know, LLM running automatically and all the tasks which are preceding LLM and after LLM are also being running is the power that is being brought by the LLM ops. User feedback capture, nothing new. You are already doing it as a part of the agile approach that you are building your software and application on. Security continues to be a part of LLM because we don't want anything to get exposed. And then the responsible AI is actually the, the, uh, the consumption of the AI in this particular area. Now, without wasting more time, I think whatever I've told you sounds like pretty much technical. I wanted to tell you all because I know that we all have been born and brought up by listening a lot of stories. So let me kind of make you remember all of these, uh, all of these typical buzzwords that you use in in Gen AI by using a small story. Consider Alice, who is a backend developer. She is droned and you know doing boilerplate configurations and a lot of repeated tasks. But now she has entered a new world of Gen AI, and Gen AI is her potential hero. Now, now how do you think you know these terms are related for him? So then look. If Gen A, if she has entered the word of Gen AI, the first thing that she does is she buzz, she buzz in the air of the uh, the the Gen AI system that she needs an API endpoint for a user registration. That's where the prompt engineering comes up. The art and science of crafting the right instruction for a Gen AI model to achieve the desired outcome and result is a science that is called as prompt engineering, and therefore. This is basically what a lot of prompt engineers usually do. They make sure that the prompts are refined in a way so that the rest of the journey that the Gen AI covers is all seamless. The second is, now once the prompts are defined, then the second aspect is, Jenny's task now travels through a sea of, sea of code, sea of best practices, sea of analysis and, and you know, prompts and responses. And using the understanding and using the you know information that was being required into the prompt, it develops an endpoint function which is ready to get integrated. This is called as LLM, which is your large language model. Now you can imagine large language model is like a powerful AI engine which has got advanced libraries, vast amount of code and knowledge, which is ready to be used, ready to be consulted, and ready to be utilized, uh, you know, for for the specific use case. Now, as I was saying, now the LLM, which has got a lot of you know quality controls that you need, right? There is a deployment, there is a performance, security checks, and all of that. Now we used to do that, you know, using DevOps and the pipelines. This name is now being used as LLM ops, where you're managing the entire thing by using LLM ops, right? Now imagine that Alice requirement has now a little bit changed. She also needs documentation. She also needs unit testing and maybe integration with the existing code. That's where the Gen AI orchestration comes into the picture, right? Where automating the complete development workflow by chaining the code completion, 
automation testing, documentation, even doing a document verification, right? So that it aligns to the pre-template that is being decided and defined is the power that is being brought by GNI orchestration. Now, assume that if Alice wants to reuse the similar code that, you know, for a similar kind of work in the future, that's where the vector DB comes in. The vector DB stores and retrieves the code in the most and efficient manner, like, much like how our cache works, right? And therefore, you know, it efficiently helps you to do a lot of refined search, efficient comparisons and all of that, right? So that whenever you are able to reuse the existing course that you have created or existing, you know, search that you predefined, they can be used very efficiently. I, I, I hope the story and, and the specific concept that we've used to describe it will continue to stay in your mind. Uh, and, and that can be, you know, let's say a, the basis and the foundation of how, uh, you know, a typical model really works. Now, I'm sure, you know, with this understanding, a lot of you who are exposed to AI ML model will always have this question. All right, I think that this lot of things which we have been talking about, I could also see this getting implemented in AI ML. So what is the difference? So here's the difference, guys. See, largely when we are looking at from an AI ML modeling perspective, what we used to do is, you know, we used to do data mining, which includes data pre-processing, putting it in a standard format. We used to do feature engineering, extract important features from the data, training and fine tuning, and then deployment and, you know, monitoring. Monitoring at that time used to be called as MLOps. And here is this, like at large level, the stack that was being used, you know, ML frameworks, ML APIs, databases, and MLOps. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what I have just described right now. But the difference is that the first and the fourth layer remains the same. The difference happens between the two layers in between. Uh, and then feature engineering is now being, you know, replaced by prompt engineering and prompt training. You remember the way I was speaking about that if, if Jenny was looking out for an API endpoints and how it, it can help to authenticate the end user, which is typically needed for building up any API integration. That's where, you know, the prompts have to be redefined and the prompts have to be fine tuned and therefore they can be effectively utilized. The second is using the foundational and fine-tuned LLMs. It is, you know, that is where, you know, you are able to kind of look through the content, right? Look through, you know, wherever you wanted the, the uh, complete data sets that you've predefined and then navigate through it and use that as a base to build up an answer to your question. By default, LLM comes in three different ways. The first is called as taker, which is where, you know, you kind of pre-use the existing integration with let's say chat GPT and all of them, and then use the, the intelligence that is already pre-built, right? The, the second is called Shaper. The Shaper is typically an LLM architecture. What it typically does, you kind of download the pre-existing models. You don't integrate with chat GPT and maybe any kind of model that you wanted to integrate with, but you download the model from you know, applications like, like Hugging Face. And then that LLM model you use and in your environment to do, you know, maybe debugging and, you know, develop prompt engineering on top of it and then start using it from there. The third, which is basically, you know, you wanted to do, you wanted to build your model by your own self. And therefore you do not either go from a shaker, taper, taker or shaper, but you actually come into the third category, which is called as maker. In maker, what you typically do, you create your own LLM model and you do it from ground up. That's definitely going to be more time consuming. And the way this is used, this is typically used for most of the industries, you know, like banking, where they wanted to be super sensitive about their data and don't want anything to go out, right? That's where I think user may be, at least in banking, the use cases which are related to business-centric information and, you know, customer-centric information. You know, I think that's where I would say the maker architecture is being used. And then deployment and monitoring is typically the same as we used to do it into AI ML. Now, as you could see, you know, we talked about a couple of stacks. So some of the examples in terms of, for example, if you wanted to look out for Gen AI orchestration, then Langchain is, you know, an application to look out for. And likewise, in the LLM models, there are multiple options. In Vector Database, there are Pinnacone and VV out of the world. In LLM Ops, you know, there are multiple other applications, you know, that you can use it uh, depending upon the way you are constructing your tech stack. So I think this is a typically kind of the background of how, or maybe a difference between the traditional ML model and a generative uh, AI ML model. 